the uh, it's it's a city that people from all over the world visit, and they go to visit the the scholar and the saint and the poet Jalaluddin al-Rumi, who's actually Jalaluddin al-Balkhi. He's originally from Afghanistan. His uh, his father was from uh, the the Taim people, Beni Taim, which is one of the clans of Quraysh. So on his father's side, he's a Bakri, a Taimi from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And then on his mother's side, his his grandfather was a scholar, was a from a ruling family in Central Asia. So. Uh, you know, we were at the maqam yesterday, and, and whenever they would teach the Methnawi, they always began with the, the, a, a verse from the Methnawi in the first uh, lesson, which is, never think that the paths to God are difficult to pass. Never think that the paths to God are difficult to pass. To work with holiness is never difficult. And that's reiterated by Ibn Atayla, who says that if you think that Allah can't change you in one moment, then you know nothing about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, we're here in the city, and it's, it's a really uh, beautiful city. It's noted for its piety in Turkey amongst the big cities. Uh, it has about a million and a half people here, but they're noted for their piety. And somebody asked one of the people that's helping us here, who's from Kunya, what they do for their nightlife. He said, come in Ramadan and we'll show you our nightlife. Alhamdulillah. So that's a good answer. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, Maulana is, he was a very notable scholar. He was not an insignificant scholar. He was actually known for his mastery of the sciences of Islam. And he was a exoteric scholar uh, for a good part of uh, the first part of his life. His father was a very well-known alim in Central Asia. And he was born in 16... which is around 1207 by the Christian era. But he, uh, his father got in a lot of trouble because he was a, he wouldn't be silent about a lot of the uh, abuses and innovations of the rulers of uh, Belch and that area. And so he would go around preaching and he actually had a lot of influence. He he was very influential as a, a preacher and a scholar. And so he was, he was basically persecuted so that he left uh, Belch in 1607 and he went on a journey. His son at that point was about three years old. So they had to uh, leave with their, and to make hijrah from a, a, a place of persecution to a freer place. What's interesting though is within a year, Belch was completely destroyed by the Mongols. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many, many of the scholars died and it was a terrible time for the Muslims. But Allah wanted something else for, for th- that family and obviously particularly for Jalaluddin al-Rumi. But he went to, they went to Damascus, they were in different places. He actually met Farid al al-Attar when he was a very young boy because he was, and Farid al al-Attar gave him his famous uh, book of poems and he actually said that he's going to be a great poet he told his father that he was going to be a great poet and a master of the path and and then when he when he came they ended up in Konya and he was uh, trained here and i think what a lot of people uh who are from the arab world um are maybe not as familiar with the the scholastic tradition of this part of the world, but they were very, very serious students. They had a great uh, madrasa system. Uh, there were several madrasas in this town, which were colleges, not schools. They were colleges, what we would call colleges today, religious colleges. But they were religious colleges where they studied many, many sciences. Uh, in the West, we have 
the concept of the trivium, which are the, the three language arts. In, in the Muslim world, there were about 30 language arts uh, that they would master. So it was a much more advanced and sophisticated uh, system. When you get into it, uh, ad advanced uh, Islamic tradition by this period, 13th, 14th, 15th century, these people were studying um, texts on um, one of the sciences that, that they were very, very uh, focused on was called Ilm al wada which is a science that teaches you how to analyze the meanings of words in context. So it's a contextual analysis of words so that you can quickly ascertain what type of word is being used to remove ambiguity because one of the m most difficult problems with language is ambiguity. And they also had isti'ara was a very important science. So they have their own tradition. They would teach balagha, which has ma'ani, bayan, bayan ma'ani, wa badi'ah. And isti'ara is part of balagha. But because it's such an important part, which is the science of metaphors, because much of language, Ibn Jinni, one of the great uh, grammarians and philologists in the Islamic tradition, argued that the vast majority of language is actually metaphor. That when you begin to analyze language, you will find that what you're dealing with is metaphors. We're using metaphors all of the time. Um, so they would study that in order to better understand and comprehend language. He, uh, he had a very, very popular madrasa here, college, uh, Maulana Jalaluddin al-Rumi. And he, he uh, had mastered all of these sciences at, at a very high level. And he was also um, extremely popular. And it, apparently from the stories, because there are some interesting biographies that were written very early that have people that knew him personally, but uh, he, was, he was a very, very unusual boy as a child. And this is always... Um, you know, one wonders about these great minds, what they were like when they were children. Uh, the, um, the talk that uh, Ken Robinson gave about the problems of education a few, a few years back, and he just mentioned about you know, we tend not to think of Shakespeare as a child, but what was he like when he was in grammar school? And how, how would the English teacher <laughs> really dealt with somebody like that? Um, so I think the same is true. It's very interesting. There's some teachers, their students actually surpass them quite early on. Um, Sa'duddin Taftazani is a good example of somebody who at a very early age had a massive opening even though he was actually considered to be not very bright in, in the, the classroom, which is often the case with great geniuses, is that people think they're actually stupid. And uh, he had a massive opening, and his teacher actually ended up putting him in the chair to start teaching the classes. So that does happen. But um, he obviously had an extraordinary experience by meeting a teacher who was completely... Uh, what we would almost call an antinomian. He was a very unusual, uh, wandering, uh, itinerant preacher who had an incredible impact and was usually chased out of places because he had such a uh, massive impact. He was a charismatic. Uh, but when, when uh, Jalaluddin fell under his... Um, spell. He really went, had a massive transformation, uh, had incredible spiritual openings, and then from him poured forth all of this incredible poetry that's read all over the world. It's been translated into countless languages. And there's pilgrims that come from Japan, that come from England, Australia, all these different places to come visit this place. And uh, I think you'll see we're going to go, inshallah, and visit the, the madrasa where it is. The cells are there. 
They, their halwa was a thousand and one nights. They would do a halwa. They, uh, they had to do um, khidma before they were actually allowed to study. So they had to go through a period of spiritual transformation. One of the, uh, one of the stipulations was that they couldn't uh, speak ill of anybody or if they were uh, treated badly, they could never retaliate. They would just have to accept everything that was done to them. And um, they had a very rigorous discipline. I think people forget how serious this early community was about their religion. And we tend to, as modern people, it's very difficult for us to imagine the, the, the type, the intensity of practice and the intensity of, of dedication and devotion that these early peoples had in their religion. One of the, the, um, one of the Andrusian poets uh, he said, "Lana usvaratum fi bishiri hindin wa uchtiha wa qaisin wa leila tu mamayin wa gailani." We have a good example in uh, Bishuru Hindin and in his sister and Qais and Leila, Leila and Majnoon, uh, and in Mayin Gailan. These are these are famous love stories of the uh, early Arabs. And what he was saying is that, is that the reason God puts the Romeo and Juliets in the world is as a proof against anyone that claims to love God that the intensity of erotic love, the intensity of love between uh, two human beings can be so great that people actually go mad and they'll do anything for the beloved. And, and so those people are there in the world as a proof, according to that poet, against people who claim to love God. Like if you say you love Allah, say, if you love Allah, if you have a claim for something, you know, the, the proof is on the one making the claim. So if you claim to love Allah, the proof is in following the Prophet and That's the proof. So that's the, 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 the proof of your love. And the Sahaba had complete tamahi. They were completely annihilated in the love of the Prophet ﷺ to such a degree that uh, Bilal, عنه, after many years of being in Syria, came back to visit Medina. And some of the Medinese convinced him to give the Adhan. It was very difficult for him, but he decided to. And when he gave the Adhan, people heard the Adhan for the first time from Bilal since the time of the Prophet. And they came out of their homes just weeping. They were just crying. That, that's how present the Prophet ﷺ was in their lives. Uh, Imam Madik, they said if the Prophet's name was mentioned, his face used to change. The color in his face would change. Um, they had uh, ishq, you know, real love. And um, so he went through that intense period. And what he talks about is love. And mahabba, which is, um, I think you'll study with Sidi Hamza in the text on Ibn Ashir. Uh, in his, he ta- talks about, وَيَتَحَلَّ uh, بِمَقَامَةِ الْيَقِينَ And the last one is mahabba, the the stations that you adorn yourself with. Because in, in traditionally in that path, you have what's called tahliya, and then you have tahliya, and then you have tajliya. And the tahliya is the emptying out. It's what the in the Christian tradition they called it kenosis, where you empty out the self. of Because the self is, is full of itself. You know, you talk about people, you know, you say he's full of it himself. That's exactly what, what it means. He's full of himself. Uh, one of the things about uh, Darija, Amiya, a lot of people don't think what these terms mean, you know, in Darija. But one of the things the Egyptians, they say, and they don't know what it means, but I, I'm convinced it's from their own spiritual tradition. If an Egyptian wants you to say, watch out, he says, khalli balik min nafsik. You know, isn't that how they say watch out? Khalli balik min nafsik. But if you actually look at what it means in Arabic, it means empty your mind of your ego. خَلِّ بَالَكْ مِن نَفْسِكَ Do the takhliya of yourself. That's how you watch out. Because <laughs> the only thing that gets you in trouble is your nafs. 
That's the only thing. It's the only thing that gets you in trouble is your nafs. And so the, the Muslims were very serious about doing work on themselves. Now they're serious about doing work on everybody but themselves. They don't want to do any work on themselves because there's nothing wrong with them. It's, it's America. That's what's wrong. It's Israel. That's what's wrong. It's uh, Bashar. That, if we could just get rid of that guy, everything would be perfect. It's everything but where it all starts. That's why. And if you look at our condition, that's the whole basis of it. The Prophet Sallallahu he began by emptying them out. He made them vessels for the truth. But first he had to empty them out. Like the famous, you know, the martial artist who wanted to study with the master. And he goes and he, and he meets the, this master that he's been uh, trying to get the, the opportunity to teach, study with them. And he, he says, oh, and I studied with master so-and-so. We did this. I did Wing Chun. And then we studied with him. And I did... Uh, this system, and then I studied with this, I did this, and he's, he's telling the master all these people he studied with and all these things he learned, and so when the tea came, he just kept pouring the tea, the master, and it, until the, the cup was just overflowing, and, and this, this man says, well, why are you, the cup's full. He said, so? He said, no, you, you should stop fulling, filling it because it's full, so it can't take any more. He said, no, of course not. If it's full, it can't take any more. He said, well, you're full, so I can't. It's the same thing. You're full. And, and you find this motif in many uh, teaching stories of Hassan al-Shadri when he went to meet Muli Abdul Sam ibn Mashish. And here's a man who went from Morocco. He was a great scholar, studied in the Qarawin. And then he went to Tunis. He studied. He went to the East. And he was looking for a spiritual master. When he got to Iraq... One of the people of Iraq told him, he said, the man you're looking for is in Morocco. So he went all the way from Morocco to Iraq, and the Iraqi man said, no, you're looking for Muli Abdusan ibn Mashish. So he went back, and he went up the mountain. For anybody that's visited that part, it's, it's near Tatwan. He went up the mountain to, to where this great sage was living, and he, when he first met him, he, he came in the clothes of the ulama. He had all these um, beautiful jalaba. And, and uh, Muri Abu Salam and Mashi said, Akhtasalt, you know, did you do ghusl? And he said, yes. He said, irja. He said, you didn't do. So he goes back. He does ghusl again. He comes back. He said, Akhtasalt, you know. He said, yes. He said, no, you didn't. Go back. So he goes back, and then on the third time, he, he you know, got the point. He obviously doesn't mean what he, what, he, what he, so he took the clothes of his servant, and he put them on, he gave his servant his clothes. And then he came, and he said, now you're ready to come. You know, you, you have to strip away. If you, and, and this is, you know, the, people don't want to do this anymore. We're like, you know, Jalaluddin al-Rumi tells a story about the barber. You know, the, they used to do tattoo. So you go to the barber, you get your hair cut, you get a tattoo. Like now in America, right? <laughs> and so he goes to the barber and he tells him, I, I want a tattoo. He said, well, what do you want? He said, I want a lion. You know, people, see, people wonder why everybody's getting tattoos now. Tattoos are about the ego, you know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Now they say, I ink, therefore I am. <laughs> that, that it's a way of letting people know I'm, I'm different. I'm special. I've got this butterfly on my back. You don't have one of those. Right? And, and then they get more and more. And they can't stop because it's not working. You know, you just keep trying to make it work. So... He wants a lion because he wants to feel like a lion. So put a lion on my back. And so the, the, the tattoo artist, he says, all right. So he starts with his needling. Ah, oh, what's that? You know, he said, that, that's, that's the tail. He says, no, 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 make it a lion without a tail. 
So he said, okay. So then he starts again. Oh, 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 what's that? He said, that's the ear. He said, no, no, make a line without ears. He said, okay. And then he starts again. Oh, oh, what's that? He said, that's the mane. No, no, make it a line without a mane. And then he does it again. He says, what's that? It's the stomach. He said, no, no, I don't want a stomach on the line. He said, listen, even God didn't make a lion like this. I can't, I can't do anything for you. And Rumi says that why he's telling the story is that this is people on the spiritual path. He says they want, they want without any work. They don't want the pain of sacrifice, of work. They, they want the finished product just there for everybody to see, but they don't want to do any of the work uh, to get there. So historically, you know, Muslims, this, I think what we tend to forget about our religion is this religion is actually about getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the point of it. It's literally to get close to Allah.